Look, I think in view of the time and everything, uh, why don't I just start with the like informal bit of the talk and maybe even leave it at that. Huh? <laughs> Numerical renormalization on the blackboard. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, um, Let's see how we do. I mean, actually, so I'm also happy to just keep it just at the informal bit and to discuss with those of you who are interested for the more technical bit. Um, so maybe, uh, maybe I'll just start. I, I mean, as you can see, Hubert, I, I brought some bin bags uh, from the Netherlands uh, uh, with me today. Uh, because uh, so for me, it's a great occasion to, to be here on this grand occasion uh, for you here. I wish we were celebrating your 30th birthday, but still, you know, you're looking great at, uh, at your age. And I hope from uh, I hope from the depth of my heart that, you know, Collier and Shetikin's wishes turn true and that we can celebrate your 120th. Um, so as you uh, as you know, so I mean, we've been friends for a, a long, long time. And I think uh, from the very beginnings, you've been always very kind to me with my inquisitive mind as a student, desperately trying to pick your brains on lots of stuff. Uh, you've given me you know, countless uh, good personal advice over the years, uh, professional advice on everything. So I'm extremely thankful for that. And it's, very, um, it's, it's kind of very difficult to think of proper um, you know, uh, gifts to give to good friends, or at least how to relate it to things. As you know, I, I'm a person of many hobbies. And uh, this summer, I kind of rekilled, rekindled one of my uh, old hobbies from you know, many years ago, uh, photography. And I was on vacation with uh, my family in the Loire uh, Valley. So I would have shown you a couple of pictures of, uh, 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 of that uh, on, the, uh, on the web. But um, uh, when, uh, when you visit the Loire Valley, of course, it's got nothing to do with you, but you know, it's France. So it's like connection enough. Um, <laughs> Yeah, exactly, exactly. You know, glorious castles, all these fantastic places where you can go see, you know, well-to-do people leaving their mark on history. Um, in the Loire Valley, there are many, many castles to, to visit. But actually, this, uh, this summer, there was one castle that we visited that I hadn't seen before, which is a bit of a special place. It's called the Chateau Brézé. Uh, it's near Chinon. And uh, the, the great thing about this castle is that the castle is great. It's really fantastic. But it's accompanied by an underground network of caves, rooms, essentially a, a whole city. And there's even like more stuff underground than above the ground. So they have these so-called uh, maisons troglodytes uh, around Chinon, really people having whole hab habitations in there. And the Chateau Brézé was, uh, uh, was a castle that kind of made use of all the soft rock there and everything. Um, so, uh, uh, so when I when I was visiting the Chateau Brézé, that's another bin bag. That's another bin bag. Yes. When you have when you have like dangerous rubbish, you need to like uh, protect it with uh, things. And even you know one can be very serious and put like uh, gloves to manipulate these things to make sure that we don't uh, we don't do that. Um, so yeah, he's looking. He's looking. Yeah. So. Uh, so in the, uh, uh, in the kind of underground system there, you, you could wander literally for hundreds of meters in there. And at some point, uh, right at the end of one of these corridors, uh, there, was, there was a room about this size uh, in there. And uh, you know, sometimes you, you, you enter places and you know things are just going to work. Uh, you, you have a nice view on something and you know you can make a kind of interesting photograph uh, with this. So it's a feeling of kind of immediate recognition, something that you uh, really all immediately feel familiar with. It's very special, you kind of uh, uh, feel some great affinity to it. And that's very much how I felt when I entered this room. So I desperately tried to, uh, to get a shot out of that. And essentially, you know, with photographs it's difficult to make stories like that, but maybe the kind of indirect story is that that's also a bit the way I felt with you when we kind of started interacting together. There was a kind of feeling of, of recognition of this was the physics I really wanted to try to do, really the stuff that I believed in, that I thought was really worth investigating and stuff. So this kind of maybe connection, very indirect here, might be the, uh, uh, the kind of theme of this thing. I will just see whether the picture has survived the trip from, from Amsterdam. Uh, but uh, yeah, so you know, it, it's a bit of a personal uh, present. I'm sorry it's kind of not directed, but this is uh, something I, I printed out for you. 
uh, for this. I mean, you can see strange shapes in there. I really like photographing things that uh, you know people look at and they say, "What the hell is that?" <laughs> yeah, yeah, it might be actually. So I mean, so so Edouard had this picture of the experiment with the little grain in the middle here. So it's something like that, but. Yeah, it's a bit physics-y and things. So, but anyway, so, uh, uh, so you don't have to worry. I mean, it's a gelatin silver print. Uh, it's actually toned in a poison called selenium. But uh, don't worry, I've washed out the poison and things. The idea of doing that is that it makes for a kind of uh, long-living thing. So hopefully this thing will even outlive your 120 and even 180 years if you ever, if you ever get there. So there, there's no glass yet, but you, you, can, uh, you can kind of frame it. Uh, uh, Whichever way, I can give you some recommendations on this. But anyway, so, so this is like a mark of uh, friendship and appreciation for, uh, for the years. It's uh, yeah, a bit of a personal present here. Yeah, we can put it, back, uh, put it back in here. And I'm putting the gloves just for the show, yeah, really. Yeah. Gloves, huh? yeah, no, no, it's OK. I can. Uh, Ah, you want it up, yeah, so with you bad, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, now for the, for the scientific talk, I mean, quite frankly, uh, I think, so I've got my talk on my computer. Um, in, view, in view of the time, I mean, I think we're already like comfortably 40 minutes late, which is coinciding with, uh, with the duration of my talk. Uh, I'm around today, I'm around tomorrow. What I was going to talk about was uh, essentially quenches, because you were begging for quenches yesterday. Uh, you also wanted to have some like, uh, technical real physics in there, so it's almost a kind of engineering talk, because uh, I wanted to talk about a numerical renormalization approach to the interaction quench in, uh, in Lieblinger. Uh, uh, what, I would, what I would say, is that you know I, I've delivered the main product here with uh, with this. As far as the science is concerned, you know you can maybe catch me over lunch and then uh, we can have a private conversation uh, on my laptop and things like that. But then I would just say, look. So, so literally, I, I mean, I propose I propose to give a lightning talk, uh, like uh, five minutes uh, or something like that, because in the end, I think the the main idea I want to communicate is uh, essentially trivial. It's really an engineering level talk, so I don't fly into beautiful, beautiful mathematics like many others at that conference here. But uh, uh, yeah, what do I want to say? So, okay, it will update, yes. So that's the Chateau de Brézé, uh, by the way, and this is the, uh, again, the update's very slow on your machines. So these are the, uh, you know, the, the insides under the castle in which all these rooms are, are to be found. So that was, uh, that was the idea. Um, so I'm going to really cut it short because, like I said, my main theme is the interaction quench in the Lieb-Linegar model. Now, there, there's a bit of background to this history that I'm now going to jump completely over because you can find it in the, in the literature. What's the story? So the story is you take uh, the Lieb-Linegar model and you want to start in a given eigenstate, the ground state, say, and you want to change the value of the interaction parameter and then track the time evolution. Ideally, you'd be able to track the whole time evolution, but at first, realistically, the one thing that you can do is track what the steady state is going to look like a long time after this quench. Um, so uh, this is quite a difficult uh, problem to solve analytically because we have no way of kind of connecting eigenstates of Hamiltonians with different interaction parameters. So we had some interesting discussions about that. In some very specific cases, it is possible to do, uh, uh, to do this. There is one specific case that uh, we managed to solve a few years ago in my group in Amsterdam, and that was starting from the ground state of non-interacting bosons, the most boring state you can think of for bosons in 1D, uh, but then map this individual eigenstate uh, uh, onto the set of eigenstates of Lieb-Linegar at a finite interaction value. So there was a formula that, uh, uh, that we found to express these exact overlaps that we then used to compute what the steady state would be using a method called the quench action method, which is essentially a variational method where you give a pseudo energy to the states based on minus the logarithm of their overlaps with the initial state. So it becomes really like a, an optimization problem. You have a different free energy, which is based on these overlaps. 
And optimizing this free energy gives you an expression for the root distributions representing the steady state at long time to which the system relaxes. So the system relaxes to that state, but it is not a thermal state, and therefore the system does not thermalize. So you have all these questions about, you know, uh, 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 how, how, how you deal with this, generalized Gibbs ensemble, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, let me actually kind of just uh, uh, completely jump uh, over this, uh, because these would be the, uh, the descriptions that I have here for this. And let me jump directly to the, the one thing maybe I want to uh, present to you today, which is work that we've done more recently on a more general problem here, which is the more general problem of taking a specific eigenstate at a certain initial value of the interaction and then quenching to a final value of the interaction. But now the CI and the CF would be in principle arbitrary. And the, uh, uh, the hope of finding an analytical solution to that, I, I mean, I guess it's not dead, but we haven't made progress. We haven't been able to do this, uh, this mapping here. So then we try to at least temporarily do the, ne the next best thing we can do, which is to do some smart, informed numerics, exploiting integrability as much as we can with this. So what is it really? It's just perturbation theory where the perturbation operator is the G2 operator, just the interaction term in there. And uh, uh, you can try to use this information to, uh, to see how it goes. And then one of the famous methods is, of course, the truncated spectrum uh, approach, where what you do is that you try to cer consider a certain window of energy and then express the state that you're looking for in the subset of states in the computational basis up to a certain energy. And here what, what you have, um, you know, because, of course, for Lieblinger, so here what I'm trying to do is to describe the ground state at the final value of the, uh, 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 of the interaction, uh, you know, in a protocol where I go from uh, an initial interaction 20 to uh, interaction 10 and try to understand, you know, how the, uh, 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 how the computational basis in the basis of the final interaction value can be used to understand the ground state at the initial uh, value. So this just shows you the convergence of the energy. It's very slow as you increase this cutoff in energy in your computational basis. So again, you know, I'm going to leave essentially all the, uh, uh, all the details out here. But what is the idea here? This idea really goes back to the early work of, uh, of Wilson. If you look at the review in 1975, it's essentially that idea. You just do some smart numerics in here where your computational basis is used to give a kind of truncated uh, approximation for what it is. And as you do the algorithm, you kind of feed more computational states in, re-diagonalize, keep the important ones, toss the less important ones, and you kind of do a real numerical renormalization here. If you want, like uh, DMRG works a bit on the, on the same idea, and you try to uh, assess convergence uh, with these things. The only difference here is that we're actually using beta ansatz as the computational basis. So this is the, uh, the kind of interesting aspect to this uh, technology here. Okay, so, so this is just uh, the usual energy. And many years ago, I did some work with uh, Robert Konick about uh, a trapped Lieblinger, again, with this numerical renormalization. So this is just what happens when you release a Lieblinger gas initially trapped in some harmonic uh, confinement. But, uh, uh, but that's not really the one I want to, uh, to focus on today. So I, I really uh, want to look at these interaction quenches. So this is work with Neil Robinson. Uh, who was a uh, former Marie Curie fellow in Amsterdam and uh, a PhD student, Bart de Klerk, uh, or Albertus uh, de Klerk uh, on the paper. Um, so where we detailed all these things. Um, so, you know, the, lots of details here. Uh, uh, convergence of the ground state energy with the NRG and the truncated spectrum uh, approach. Uh, let me maybe jump immediately to, uh, uh, to the kind of big question here. So traditionally, when you do renormalization, the criterion that specifies whether you include states or not is purely the energy. You keep the low energy states first, and then you increase this cutoff. But the big question that you can pose is, is this like a smart thing to do? And of course, the answer to this is no. It's one of the things you can do, but you end up doing way too much work here because there are many states that contribute much more to the question you're asking uh, uh, that don't live in this, uh, this thing here. So you're, you're looking for a different ordering. And here, one of the first things that you can think of is you look at your perturbation operator and thinking of a kind of perturbation theory logic, you don't just care about the energy. You care about the matrix elements of these things. So whether 
the perturbation operator can connect your initial state to some intermediate states, even if they're at high energy. And we understand quite a lot about these matrix elements by now to indeed understand that there are states at high energy that, or you know, relatively high energy, that are connected to very efficiently with very simple operators. And this is what is illustrated here. You've got like an ordering uh, with uh, you know, most important state down and then listed up. These are the quantum number patterns that you have for these important states. So immediately what that tells you is that, forget about the energy, the most important states for what you want to do here are states where you've pushed a few particles out at high energy. But these are important because the matrix elements are very, very good. So you want to look at a different ordering. And this matrix element ordering, you can then implement in your numerical renormalization. And when you do that, uh, you get uh, this kind of brutally more efficient convergence in very few steps by just choosing the states smartly. OK, so, so renormalization should be done not with energy cutoffs, but really with like matrix element ordering or something smarter here. Uh, and that's like uh, part of the main message that I, that I have here. Um, so, so all the data that I have here that I'm going to just flash and then refer to private discussions afterward if you want is about refining this kind of ordering that we can predict for these states. And if we get good at predicting which states are important, then we can make all our method much more, much more efficient. So that's the, uh, that's the kind of idea. Uh, over the years, you know, de developed a lot of methods to compute correlation functions uh, in equilibrium, thermal equilibrium and things. Uh, th these kinds of codes are known as abacus. And they're, about, they're based on essentially computations of matrix elements using algebraic beta ansatz, finite size systems, so we can create equations. We get numbers for all these matrix elements and can just combine them in the way we want. So the idea here is that we kind of develop almost a, an oracle for, um, uh, uh, for generating states in the computational basis in an order which is maximally efficient. So you will just spit out your states for your energy. What is the role of states? I'm sorry? For this parameter, for EMPS, uh, Unit density. Yeah. So typically, we just work at unit density, and we just tune the interaction parameter. Itself, yeah. Uh, so uh, yeah, so 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 that's the idea. We just kind of uh, refine this uh, this optimal ordering here, and uh, yeah. So so you can see that in terms of computational efficiency, it's way more performant than uh, what you would have uh, what you would have had otherwise. And you can reconstruct then further information than just the steady state. So for example, here these are simple. Uh, computations for the actual time dependence of certain simple quantities after the quench. You can do that because you've got access to the full computational basis after the quench and you just, you know, it's like first year quantum mechanics, you just put back the time evolution, plot your observables and, uh, and see how it goes. Uh, so you can play with uh, uh, local observables, things like fidelity and whatnot. Okay, so, uh, so, so, so that's the talk. That's the kind of punchline message. There's a lot of technology available from integrability that allows you to smartly do your numerics in a much more efficient way than you would otherwise do if you didn't have integrability. These are uh, computations for the Lieblinger model, which is the simplest model that we, can, uh, that we can deal with. We are very busy now to try to extend that to spin chains, to XXZ spin chains, where we would like, for example, to change the value of the anisotropy and also just reconstruct the time dynamics in there. But of course, the challenge of the spin chains is much higher than the Lieblinger because of the structure of the solutions to the beta equations. We have to deal with string states, deviated string states. We have to compute the matrix elements of all these things. There's a lot of work, but hopefully, you know, uh, before your next birthday, uh, uh, we'll have some, uh, 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 some, some results to, to show on this. OK, so uh, uh, I mean, really, this is the message. <laughs> so if anybody, anybody wants to have like technical discussions, how this is done, precisely what the, uh, the ordering criteria are, what it actually means in terms of the way you should think about renormalization, then I'm very, very happy to have that. I do believe that there's a lot of work to be done in how physicists think about renormalization, just on a purely you know, computational, uh, uh, you know, uh, like a CPU ticks 
uh, predictions level, there is a massive optimization to be had with proper knowledge of the microscopics and the technicalities of, uh, of these models. So hopefully that's going to deliver some you know, results uh, later on. And again, you know, I wish we had beautiful mathematical you know, descriptions of these overlaps and whatnot, but failing that, this is the next best, best thing that we can do. Yeah? So let's just catch up a bit on the schedule by saying, anybody interested in these things, just grab me. I'm here until tomorrow. And then uh, you can see how it goes. Thank you.